care about current affairs, it's on the old show. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself into the old show, it's the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. Welcome to the old show, Canada's current affairs show with strong opinions. We have got a great guest for you on the pod today from Environment Hamilton, which has been on the tip of the spear when it comes to dealing with Ford government and their green belt grab, also trying to protect our large urban boundary. There is huge risk that I wasn't even aware of to our farmland and to our urban boundaries in the province of Ontario. It will be catastrophic if we don't stand up and stop what's about to happen. We're also going to talk to Ian about a disturbing situation in Hamilton where Mayor Andrea Horvath had concerns about a small little program to protect seniors from sweltering to death in this hot summer climate. Uh, What was with the opposition to that and one councillor's completely off base comments? We'll get into all of that with Ian. Coming up though on the pod, our next podcast, we're gonna have Gil Panalosa, the international urbanist, the founder of 880 Cities and Better Cities. He has a lot to say about Mayor Olivia Chow, Ontario Place, the Doug Ford government, the 413, and what we're not doing as citizens on the next Osho podcast. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube or wherever you get your pod. Let's get into a really important conversation about our environment and about what we're about to lose in the province of Ontario. It's a warning to the rest of Canada and around the world uh, of when profit takes priority over protecting our environment. It's devastating, it's catastrophic. Let's talk to Ian. Welcome to the O Show, Ian. He is with Environment Hamilton. I have often felt like Hamilton is on the tip of the spear when it comes to the green belt scandal. We're not it, we're not done with this, right? I mean, we protested it. There's an RCMP investigation, but is there still risk? And can you just talk about that for our audience? Yeah, so we're actually recording this on June 5th. And right now, the province is looking at Bill 185, which is the Cutting Red Tape Act, uh, as all these uh, different acts have had interesting names from this government. And while before we saw very clear, um, I would say almost straightforward attempts of removing land from the green belt, benefiting specific developers and the, you know, the tune of billions of dollars, we've now seen a variety of other tactics taken by this government that all are working towards the same goal, which is enabling sprawl, allowing land speculators to cash in on the farmland they've been sitting on, and in many cases, allowing to go through neglect and not become productive farmland anymore. Um, And so what we're looking at with Bill 185 is a variety of changes. Um, Groups like Environmental Defense, coalitions like the Alliance for for a Livable Ontario and the like there too have been raising the alarm about Bill 185. But I think the most perhaps alarming part about Bill 185, and as it's relevant to the city of Hamilton, and and again, it's relevant to all of Ontario at this point, is that it's going to allow land speculators to initiate their own urban boundary reviews. And so if you think about the previous fight that we had here in Hamilton, for any viewers who weren't aware, there was a proposal from developers to expand the urban boundary. This was as a result of the Doug Ford government essentially saying, oh, you need to accommodate more uh, population growth by building a certain type of housing. And we successfully fought back against that. But instead of now allowing cities to be in the driver's seat about these issues and uh, you know make decisions about what's best for the growth of individual cities, we're now seeing developers and land speculators being put in the driver's seat. So if a land developer or a group of developers, which is the case here in the city of Hamilton, own a variety or a group of parcels of land in the rural area, they can now, after 185 passes, initiate their own urban boundary expansion review. They can also, uh, as a result of 185, we're seeing, well, for one thing, we're seeing the entire planning uh, uh, act kind of get thrown out the window. But what we're also seeing is a limitation on what municipalities and individuals can do in terms of pushing back against this. So it's actually going to severely curtail the ability of groups like us, Environment Hamilton, cities like the city of Hamilton, or other property owners near the proposed developments from taking issues to the OLT, the Ontario Land Tribunal. So while yes, the OLT, I think, you know, 
admittedly, we can admit uh, is a significant uh, boundary to or barrier to uh, seeing the development that we want to see happen. The old team makes many decisions that uh, I certainly don't agree with and get frustrated by. It still provides an important ability for people to weigh in in a democratic way on what is happening in their own lived environment. And by taking that away, we're not just, you know, cutting red tape, we're fundamentally altering what our democratic rights are in our society. And we're allowing land to speculators to essentially do whatever they want. At the same time, Bill 185 also removes density requirements, so there will be no minimum density that they have to build on this former farmland. And there's a variety of other changes that are buried within that bill as well. But I think the most essential way of putting it is, instead of Doug Ford making decisions about land use planning that was not in our interest, he's just giving the keys to land speculators directly. I can't even imagine the implications of that when I think about, you know, the uh, green belt, of course, being the lungs of the GTHA. But you think about all that farmland and when Gil Penalosa, uh, for our listeners and viewers, you're going to want to watch the next o show as well and listen to it because he talked about the incredible generational devastation that will happen with the 413. And it's not about the highway, it's about all of that land. And when I think about what you're saying, these farmlands, I mean, we are losing, I forget the uh, stunning amount of acreage of, lar of farmland daily in this province, uh, but we need that. I mean, aren't we seeing, Ian, today is World Environment Day, uh, and aren't we seeing globally that the ability to grow food locally, to be able to sustain locally is incredibly important, especially around climate mitigation. Uh, when we talk about flooding and, and protecting our, our watersheds, I mean, the, the idea of giving the keys to land speculators because they're in it for a profit motive to build whatever kind of McMansions or whatever they want to do to make the most money. Um, I mean, it just sounds to me like this is this this decision might be catastrophic if you're giving the keys to the people whose interest is profit and not all of the things I just mentioned. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I honestly, I think that's the best way of describing this provincial government when it comes to land use policies and looking at the future of the province is catastrophic. Um, yeah, we, we lose farmland every day in this province. And it's really important to note that farmland has a variety of benefits, as you were mentioning, helps with uh, mitigation of flooding, helps with cooling our area, so we're not building out, we're not, you know, paving over everything. But it's also really important to note, in southern Ontario, we have a profoundly unique ability to grow a wide variety of foods. So it's not just that we have farmland that's similar to the prairies where you can grow a lot of wheat and the like there too. We have an incredible variety of crops that can be grown in southern Ontario, crops that often cases people complain about seeing, you know, being shipped in from South America and the like there too. And if by removing this land permanently, because once you pave over farmland, you can't get it back. That soil is no longer viable for farmland even if you were to remove the houses that were on top of it in the future, we're essentially removing our ability of feeding our own province, our own country, with foods that we take for granted right now. And as climate change continues to get worse, as it impacts other economies around the world, we're going to start looking at these decisions that are being made today. And future generations, you know, our children are going to be looking back at this time period and thinking, we knew exactly where everything was going with climate change. We have the modeling to predict this. We are now seeing the early stages of climate change really come into effect on us as a Western society. And yet we're continuing to double down on removing our ability to grow food, build sustainably, while at the same time, not even building housing that people want. We're building housing that people can't even afford, yet it's what developers can make the most profit off of. You know, it's, uh, we will be judged. We are being judged by current, talk to a teenager. I have two of them. You know, <laughs> they're already angry about how far we've let climate and the climate emergency get to and the kind of dystopic future they may be facing. But the fact that to your point, the Ford government keeps making it worse, keeps putting in these catastrophic decisions. The 413 will be catastrophic for the environment. The Greenbelt grab 
catastrophic because I didn't realize until you just said it, Ian, that once you pave over farmland, you can't get that land back. You know, I I, I thought that maybe if we got a different government in, they would be able to, to reverse some of the damage being done by this premier, by Ford giving up these the oversight of our environment, giving up our farmland, letting speculators do whatever the hell they want. Uh, I thought we could reverse it at some point, but you're saying once we give up that land, that ability to feed ourselves, that ability to sustain and to protect ourselves from flooding by preserving our watershed, all of those considerations that we need to make as a society, they're going to go out the window with this premier and we won't be able to fix it after the fact. I mean, that is terror. That is terrifying to hear that. So, I mean, what, just on this before we get to some other issues that are driving me bananas today, but what can we do? I mean, is this is this legislation already a fait accompli now that the legislature is sitting for a big, long holiday break? Are we screwed? Well, I think it's really important to note that there has been a number of times where we have won against this government because what they're doing is genuinely very unpopular across the spectrum. Um, we're now, you know, well into the second term. We're hearing rumors that there may be an early election called because the Doug Ford government's concerned about their own election chances, depending on what happens at the federal level and what have you. But it's absolutely vital that we in our communities now start talking, preparing for that provincial election, particularly if it's called early. There has been changes made to election law that limits the ability of groups like us as Environment Hamilton to weigh in on provincial politics during a campaigning period. So it's absolutely vital that we are active now, today, talking to our neighbors, talking to other community members, getting ready to vote this government out. Because quite frankly, that's what it's going to take. Um, I've been asked this a lot, you know, by other journalists and people who, you know, have to remain more objective uh, about these things. But the, the frank reality of it is now that we've seen what the priorities of this provincial government are. We've seen how difficult it is to, you know, even work out a compromise with them. And so what we can all do is protest and get ready to vote them out either in 2026 or or earlier if they choose to do so. Well, I mean, it's uh, I don't know if groups like yours are supposed to stay nonpartisan. Uh, I don't have a political party that I vote for regularly. I'm not part of any party and I don't do any kind of talking points or boosterism for any party. I hate partisan politics, but I am absolutely wanting to see the end of this Ford majority, uh, because what we have seen is catastrophic and irreversible, whether it's with our environment, like we're talking about, Ian, or whether it's with our healthcare system and privatizing that, the way that our, our neighbors are being put into homelessness through rent evictions and profiteering in the rental market. I mean, there's so many things, decisions this government is making, Ontario Place, the rest of it, yeah. wasting our money, profiting their pals. I, and we can all see it. Uh, and and I hope that we are engaged in doing it. But I have to ask you just before we move on to the crap that's going on uh, around air conditioning, which is just our listeners are going to lose their minds. Uh, is there do you pay a price as a organization to speak out and to say that we need to organize against basically the hand that feeds you? Well, I mean, while we aren't being fed by this provincial government right now, I'll say I'll say that mm -hmm. um, at, we are a not for profit. We're not a charity. So we do political advocacy and we will work with whoever is in power. Um, but I think the reality is, and I'm not the first environmentalist to say this in, in Ontario, this government doesn't want to come to the table. They don't want to do what's best for Ontarians. Um, I wouldn't be saying that about any previous governments. You can always find compromise with elected officials, even, uh, you know, our local uh, elected officials that we're going to be talking about in a moment. Um, but I think, you know, after that first term into this second term, um, we have really seen what the actual intention of this government is. And as a advocacy organization that pushes forward the best policies, quite frankly, yeah, this, this government isn't doing it. Uh, it's not doing what we need them to do, and nor are they interested in even learning or understanding where we're coming from on this issue. And so it is quite extreme. And I think it's important for us in the civil society realm to point that out. And there's a lot of other groups and other sectors doing the same. Um, but I think, you know, 
to have an organization like us more or less feel forced to say this. And I'm, this isn't the first time I've talked about this. Um, and we're not the only organization talking like this. I, I, I think that proved, that shows just how extreme this provincial government is compared to either previous provincial governments or our federal or municipal. Extreme provincial government, the Doug Ford government is extreme in their policies when it just comes to the environment. Uh, and these are irreversible policies. Once this stuff happens, we can't fix it. We can't just build it back up. We will lose these farmlands. We will lose these watersheds. We will be setting ourselves up for a catastrophic future from an environmental lens. You're saying that what the Ford government is doing by putting forward this legislation, by giving the keys to these land speculators who can then come up with their own urban boundaries, essentially, they can build whatever they want on farmland that we need that we cannot get back. It is a catastrophic reality that you're you're signaling to me here today. Is the green belt still vulnerable to those land grabs. Are we now talking about the 413 lands? We're talking about urban boundaries possibly expanding all over the province. Is the green belt still at risk? We'll, we'll see. Um, there is still the green belt review coming up that will be happening within this term of government, depending on when the election is. I think that the people of Ontario have really made their voices heard on the green belt issue. Um, but I think for us here in Hamilton, the real struggle is, is that we have an incredible amount of farmland that isn't part of the green belt. And so I think when we're talking about a future government, not only are they going to have to come in and reverse a lot of this legislation that allowed this permanent change to happen to our landscape, we're also going to have to see more permanent decisions being made, such as an expansion of the green belt bringing in more rural lands into this land and really figuring out a way of ensuring that a future provincial government can't do what this Doug Ford government has done. Okay, uh, so let's talk about, <laughs> for people who know Andrea Horvath, she was uh, the NDP leader official opposition, as she said, the year that they won. Uh, and she was uh, up against Doug Ford. And I think a lot of people listening to this podcast are still pretty frustrated that she didn't take the fight to Ford more and focused on liberal Del Duca at the time. E. Walston with another majority. She decided to quit and become the mayor of Hamilton. Uh, and my opinions on how she's done as mayor are, are well documented. <laughs> I talk about them with Gil Penalosa as well in the next episode. When I heard the her response to a proposal put forward by a number of organizations using some of the money that was set aside for environmental uh, issues, I say, you know, we need to make sure that our most vulnerable residents, people who are ill, people who are seniors, people who are shut-ins, we must help them get air conditioning because of the climate emergency, because of our warming planet, because of our sweltering summers. Uh, her response, I, I, I didn't think, showed compassion. And then uh, John Paul Danko, who we've had on the program, came out with some, I thought, pretty ridiculous tweets suggesting that, you know, poor people were going to scam this program, suggesting that, you know, air conditioning is not environmentally friendly. So why on earth would we be helping people get it? So can you just tell me first what Andrea's response was and um, why this is so offside and, and is important enough to talk about here on the O Show? Yeah, so I'll take a step back and, and just lay out that Myself and a number of other Hamiltonians sit on a working group that was convened by Hamilton City staff that are within the public health department. Mm -hmm. And it's the Extreme Heat Working Group. It's important to note that it's a working group. It's not a committee. Um, our terms of reference are fairly loose. We, you know, just commit to attend meetings and share our thoughts on things. And part of that was providing feedback on the Extreme Heat Response Plan for 2023. <laughs> now, it's absolutely important to note that Unanimously, our council has moved forward with pursuing a max heat bylaw for all rental properties. Much like how we have a minimum temperature bylaw, this would be a maximum temperature bylaw that would protect tenants, all tenants in the city of Hamilton from extreme heat in their units, be it, uh, you know, they're renting a house, they're renting an apartment, they're in a basement, no matter what. This is an absolutely vital and first of its kind in Ontario step to protect tenants and understanding that much of what could be done to protect tenants from extreme heat is, of course, air conditioning. However, that's going to take some time. This is a first of its kind type bylaw. It's mm -hmm. not going to be implemented for 2024. Uh, 
you know, we'll be lucky if it's implemented by 2025, just because this does take a long, a long amount of time. And there is the potential of legal action being taken against the city over this. And that's worthwhile. I, I want to be very clear of that. I'm very supportive of both Mayor Horvath and uh, Councillor Danko's support of that effort. However, um, when the extreme heat response plan came forward, it was done, you know, very quickly. There was a lot of feedback from the working group on different actions. And it's really important to know in that working group, it's not just groups like Environment Hamilton and Hamilton Acorn, who are essentially outside advocates. It's also city services. There's a representative from the Hamilton Public Library. And the discussions in that group aren't just feedback on the plan, but an actual discussion of implementation and the limits of what service uh, services and agencies can provide during extreme heat events. So it's not just about the heat response, but a variety of other logistical concerns that for me as a representative from Environment Hamilton is extremely valuable for me. And I found the working group uh, and the time that I put into the working group to, to be very valuable. However, you know, recognizing that extreme heat is certainly uh, still a reality and there's certainly going to be extreme heat events before this bylaw comes into effect. We had a, a few suggestions. And so it was us as, as Environment Hamilton leading the charge was Hamilton uh, Acorn. Uh, we were also joined by the Hamilton Community Legal Clinic, as well as the Canadian Environmental Law Association. And we essentially had three different suggestions uh, for that extreme heat response. And we delegated to council. This was at the end of April, so before the summer started. And we asked for three things. Uh, more robust timelines and, and goals associated with the different actions in it, which we, we were given. Um, looking at free busing on extreme heat events, so that way people can get to and from cooling centers or from their work. Extreme heat can have a significant impact on cognitive ability. So, you know, being able to choose to hop on the bus for free and allows you to cool yourself off before you arrive at work, extremely valuable. And we got that too. So again, these were two things that weren't in the extreme heat response strategy that were then added in, were approved by council at our suggestion. And the third one was, we would like to see the city move forward with some in-suite protections for vulnerable residents. And so at that meeting, it was on April 29th, I believe, or it could have been the 28th, uh, don't quote me on that, um, we had delegations. So Jacqueline Crawley from the Canadian Environmental Law Association delegated, I delegated, the number of Hamilton Acorn members delegated, so did other uh, group representatives and individuals. And we said, look, this heat response plan is very good. There is, however, some pieces that we think could make it stronger. And we were saying that not just as people who are within the working group, but also outside advocates as well. And at the time, we were really appreciative of seeing uh, a motion brought forward, and it was brought forward by Cameron Kretsch, uh, the Ward 2 councillor, um, essentially trying to see those three demands be abided by and included in the extreme heat response. Unfortunately, at that meeting, um, the first two pieces that I outlined were approved, um, but Ward 1 Councillor Maureen Wilson was unsure of this third piece, which was a proposal of using $52,000 from the Climate Change Reserve Fund, which is an annual fund that is a total of $2.5 million. So again, we're talking about less than half a percent of the overall Climate Change Reserve Fund being used for an expansion of an existing Ontario Works program that's subsidizes AC units for low-income uh, renters who also have a medical condition that enables them to need AC. So they have to apply for the program, they have to provide medical reference and prove that they have a medical need for essentially a subsidized or free AC depending on how expensive the unit is. Within the city of Hamilton, I believe there's maybe roughly like no more than 100 uh, units that have received uh, one of these AC units. And the $52,000 would really only cover at most 200 AC units. So we're talking about a very small interim measure that would essentially protect 200 or you know more if it's a multiple uh, member household from extreme heat. And in the case of Hamilton and in the case of who would be affected by this program, we're talking about seniors, we're talking about people with disabilities, people who have pre-existing medical conditions like asthma, who essentially we would be able to guarantee wouldn't need to be taking trips to the ER for heat exposure. So unfortunately, that one piece was deferred to a future meeting. Um, 
we were certainly uh, not happy with that because we were trying to push this through before the summer started. We appreciated that some councillors, and in, in particular Cameron Crutch, as I mentioned before, but Alex Wilson of Ward 13, Temi Wang of Ward 4, and Rinder Nan of Ward 3, all agreed that this should be passed before the summer starts, but unfortunately the majority of council deferred it and uh, uh, with that deferral motion brought forward by Maureen Wilson. Skip forward a month, uh, we've already seen some, some heat, not an extreme heat event, thankfully. Um, and this deferred uh, action was brought forward. We had a few more pieces of information attached to it to kind of, I guess, put councillors' minds at ease about it. And again, from my perspective, this is a very small interim measure to take just to protect a small number of renters within the city of Hamilton as we're waiting for this extreme heat bylaw to come into effect. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't seen that way by some city councillors. There was extensive debate. Um, there was uh, allegations that this was being brought forward by one group and one councillor, which wasn't the case. Um, and there was a variety of discussions about how it was potentially a half-baked uh, idea or it overrode the work of the Extreme Heat Working Group. And, and again, I, I sit on the Extreme Heat Working Group. So does <laughs> Hamilton Acorn and a variety of other groups. Well, I believe that the councillor, John Paul Danko, likened it to policy made on a napkin, I think was his his language. Yeah. Um, doesn't and, sound and what like was it also, was and sorry, and, a napkin to me. It sounds like there's been a lot of meetings on this. Yes, and it's also important to note that on Monday's meeting, two other members of the Extreme Heat Working Group, one of them being a representative from the Landlord Association, delegated in favor of this action. And when we as the Extreme Heat Working Group met last week, there was not a single member who was opposed to it. Now, I want to be very clear, there are members of the Extreme Heat Working Group that don't do policy advocacy. They're a service provider or in some cases an actual City of Hamilton employee, but there was no opposition to this. There was no one in the groups raising so concerns. Was about it Andrea? This. Was it Andrea who called it half baked? Was that her quote? Yes, and there was concerns from her that we were overriding the Extreme Heat Working Group, and so my frustration as an outside advocate came from the fact that, to me, um, I, I saw one councillor out of the four who were trying to get this to go forward um, being targeted in a in a way that was concerning to me as they were responding to our demands and then they were getting attacked over it. Yeah. Um, but also on top of that, I think there was a real misconception and misperception being presented to the public about this where we had been meeting for months about this and we thought that this was a again an interim measure that could really strengthen this mm -hmm. that unfortunately didn't make its way into the original plan but that's fine with us too because council was ready to move on this and yes it, it did seem i understand for some councillors it would seem sort of a surprise it was last minute but it's really important to note that that report that extreme heat response plan for 2024 came out on a Thursday, you know, a Thursday, the meeting was on a Monday. There wasn't a lot of time for a response here. And if we wanted to act with urgency before the summer started, it yeah. was at that end of April meeting that we needed to see this get approved. So then that way it could be implemented for the summer. That wasn't the case. So it's absolutely important that yes, while the city is moving forward on a max heat bylaw, and then that max heat bylaw if effective and successful, will protect tenants. Tenants like me, I mean, I already have AC provided by my landlord, so it's not impossible. And so um, do councillors when they go to City Hall to work, exactly. which I pointed out to our good friend, John Paul Danko. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it, it, it's absolutely vital to, to, to note that we could have been taking this interim measure much earlier. And, you know, for, for a viewer who potentially doesn't think about municipal budgets that often, it's really important to note that this isn't going to have any impact on property taxes. Well, not it's, only that, but I mean, Matt Jelly pointed out how many ceremonial horses the police department gets uh, compared to the air conditioning units for 200 Hamiltonians who could die if they don't have access to the air conditioning. I mean, it's important to note that the, the mounted unit is an annual expense. This was a one-time usage of a reserve 
reserve that already exists. We've already put that 2.5 million aside for this year. So, we, so, we so just less so I'm clear. So there's a reserve set aside. You you said to council, we need to take a little tiny bit of this, much less than is used for other things in Hamilton, like, oh, I don't know, a million three to fix a bathroom. But you know what? We're going to we're gonna do this. We're gonna save 200 people's lives this summer while we're waiting for this great extreme heat bylaw to take effect next year. We're gonna spend a little bit of money to save lives. And that is being met with derision, with comments that it was done on the back of a napkin, with stupid comments about, you know, ooh, is an air conditioning bad for the environment? Yeah, but you know what? Necessary to keep these people alive because we're in a climate emergency. So, I mean, the tenor of the debate was ridiculous. The The pushback sounds like it was totally unfounded. So, so you know, shame on the councillor for reducing the conversation to a level of almost looks like populist nonsense and getting taxpayers upset. I mean, really, this is a tiny amount for money that was set aside to save people's lives while we wait for another bylaw to come into effect to help with this climate emergency. Uh, it, it shouldn't have been raised to the level of conversation or, or brought down to the level of conversation publicly that it has been. So I, I think that's shameful and populist garbage. That being said, it did pass, correct? These people yeah. are going to get the relief. So it passed 13 to 1. Um, there were two councillors who weren't present for the meeting, uh, Councillors Brad Clark and Ward 5 Councillor, uh, 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 completely blanking on Matt's last name right now. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no, uh, sorry. Uh, uh, um, oh, shoot. What is his name? That's okay. Don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, it, it yeah, so it ended up... It ended up being passed 13 to 1. There were some councillors who weren't in attendance. Um, Councillor Danko was the only one to vote against it. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think as well, you know, it's frustrating because this overall is such a small, yeah, in, impactful, but ultimately very small. A uh, step being taken by the city of Hamilton to protect just 200 households, if well, that. I want uh, to as well. For, I want to thank you for pushing through and for making us aware of the pushback, which seems to me to be more about politics than it is about any kind of policy or any kind of fiduciary responsibility on behalf of the councillor. Margaret Skimba said it best. She said, "Stay classy, not classist," because uh, the idea that people who need help more than anything else and are facing a climate emergency that is just proportionately impacting people who live in poverty. I mean, let's it's World Environment Day. The places around the world, the people around the world who are going to most most take the hit for climate change are the people who already have the least. So if we're not able to protect these people, to do these small measures like giving them the air conditioning that they need to survive a sweltering summer, then we have to give our heads a shake. Our priorities are wrong or we're not following the science. Um, so I want to thank you at Environment Hamilton for what you're doing, not only for these people who need the help and for winning despite what you've gotten back, uh, but also for fighting for the green belt, fighting to make us aware of this urban boundary legislation that'll change and basically change the game to give developers free reign to do what they want with our precious farmland. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you raising the alarm and calling on people to rise up and to act and to, to stop another term of this government because they just won't come to the table and it sounds like they just don't care about uh, the future of all Ontarians. It seems much more like it's about a profit motive with the Ford government. So I want to thank you Ian for all that you do. I know that we're taking your time and you've got somewhere else that you need to be today but uh, I couldn't have thought of a better guest for World Environment Day and I, I want to thank all of our listeners and viewers from around the world of the Osho and to subscribe if you haven't already wherever you get your pods or on YouTube so you keep getting these important conversations because as Gil Penalosa, our next guest says, he's a, a, of course a top urbanist globally. He said that really the issues that we're dealing with in all of our communities around the world are similar. You know, whether it's climate change, whether it's housing, whether it's homelessness, whether it's planning for sustainable communities. These are conversations that we all need to be having all the time together in order to build a better world and a safer, more sustainable one. Thanks so much, Ian from Environment Hamilton. And thank you for watching and listening to the OSHA. And when you want to get clear what's going on here, it's on the old show. If you like to stay in the know, tune yourself into the old show. It's the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. With a lot of great guests, she puts them to the test on the old show. 
there's no doubt they'll be calling them out on the old show. Stand for something or fall for it all. Ontario, hear the call of the old show. It's a podcast, the old show. Laura Babcock's the old show. Stay informed with the old show, old show. Your merch, your merch <laughs> <bin>. <laughs>